Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts... Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to the Society in the State podcast. Connor is uh, off for this episode, but I'm very happy to have Jacob Hornberger joining me for today's podcast. Uh, Jacob is the president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and and Jacob, I know that's that's the most notable title. I, I read your uh, your commentaries at least five times a week as they come in my email. Fill in some of the gaps as to who you are and what you do for our listeners. Okay, well, thanks for having me on the show, Brian. It's great to talk to you again. Uh, I'm president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, which is a nonprofit educational foundation that advances an uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And uh, we're trying to shift the course of uh, direction for America. We think it's moving in a very bad direction. It has moved in a very bad direction for decades, and we're trying to move it in a pro-freedom, pro-prosperity, pro-peace direction. Now, speaking up for freedom historically has has always carried a degree of risk. And one of the reasons that we have you on the podcast today is to share with us your take on one of the most notable historical examples of uh, the courage of conviction as it pertains to freedom. And that, of course, is referring to the to Sophie Scholl and the White Rose Society. Um you wrote, uh, I think it was called A Lesson in Dissent, about the White Rose Society, but I'd like to have you walk us today through some of the, the lessons that we can learn from a young woman who was growing up in Nazi Germany and and made a very courageous stand and paid with her life for making that stand. Um, where do you begin to, to start to relate the, the principles and the lessons that we could learn from Sophie Scholl and the White Rose Yeah, that article is actually my favorite article of all the thousands of articles I've written um, uh, over the years. It's called The White Rose, A Lesson in Dissent, and I'm I'm really pleased that it got reprinted in a a book on the Holocaust for high school students here in the United States. Uh, It is the most remarkable story of courage and adherence to principle that, that I think I've ever come across. Um, I, I learned about it, ironically enough, I was, I was hiking in the, uh, with a group in the Shenandoah Valley, and, or in the, in, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, I mean, and uh, there was a young German woman on the hike who told me about the White Rose, and that's when I started digging it up, and I was astounded. That what happened was that in the midst of World War II, uh, this t- uh, two siblings, Hans and Sophie Scholl, who were not Jewish, they were Lutherans, a very, very devout um, brother and sister, uh, realized, came to the realization that the Hitler regime was very destructive to, to Germany. Uh, this was in the midst of the war. And so they had heard their father criticize Hitler, which kind of befuddled them when they were young. Because, you know, it's sort of, they couldn't understand that. And they were part of the Hitler youth and, and the, the, the women's counterpart to the Hitler youth. But finally, they realized what their father was talking about. And so in the middle of war, in the middle of this totalitarian regime, these two young people, she's 21, he's 23, get together with a few other friends and start publishing secretly and surreptitiously a a series of of pamphlets exhorting Germans to rise up against their own government in the middle of the war and, and overthrow the Hitler regime. And of course, it was a high-risk operation. I mean, they had to keep things very, very secret. They would travel on trains to other cities to deposit these pamphlets. If they got caught, they knew what was going to happen to them. And it was the first time the dissent had surfaced in Germany. So the Gestapo went crazy. Hitler went crazy trying to figure out who this was. And so they ultimately published six essays called The White Rose. And it, it had such an impact on me. I started studying and reading the books on what, what they had done that I actually went to Germany and visited the University of Munich where they were. And the, they've got a little plaza there with brick inlays in the plaza with uh, quotes from the, from the White Rose essays. And uh, today, I think most Germans know about the Scholl siblings. They have schools named after them and so forth. But it really raises interesting issues on patriotism. I mean, clearly, they were not considered patriots by the Nazi regime. 
In fact, very few governments, including even the U.S. government, ever looks at dissidents against the wars that that regime is, is fighting to be the patriots. They usually look at them as, as the traitors. And that's, of course, how the German um, regime looked on, at, um, on Hans and Sophie Scholl. Okay, so let's, let's walk back just a little bit further. Uh, the Germany that they were growing up in, how did so many of their countrymen miss the unmistakable departure from morality? that the Scholes and some of their friends were able to see? Well, it, it really, you, you have to understand what was going on in that, during that period of time, the post-World War I period. I mean, it's, and, and the, you know, it even requires an examination of U.S. interventionism in World War I. I mean, here the warring parties had gone to war and um, you know, millions of people had died with no territorial gains by anyone. And so it was clear that that there was going to have to be a negotiated settlement of the war. Uh, the Germany was broke, Britain was broke, France was broke, and and neither and none of them had got anywhere. Same with Russia. And then then you have the Russian Revolution, where the communists take over in Russia. Well, the U.S. government intervenes in World War One, which was really none of its business, but it results in the total defeat of Germany. And that leads to the Treaty of Versailles and the chaos and crisis in Germany. So then the Great Depression hits, and, and Germany's in the midst of all this. It's got huge reparations as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. It has communist turmoil, where communists are trying to take over provinces in Germany. And, and in the middle of all this, Hitler seizes the opportunity to rise to power. And he promises the Germans that he's going to lead them out of the Depression. And in fact, he follows many of the economic policies of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that there should be government central planning, that there should be a great big military industrial complex, public works, the Audubon system that was later used as the model for America's interstate highway system. Well, lo and behold, these policies seem to pull Germany out of the depression. And all of a sudden, Germans are getting pride in their country back again. They, they see the economic prosperity. They're having the Olympics there. So a lot of Germans like this. But when I say a lot, it certainly wasn't a majority. A lot of Germans saw through uh, what you know, the, the potential tyranny of this kind of a regime. And in fact, the, the Nazis never really want a majority of votes. Uh, that what happens is is that they they do get a large number elected to the parliament, the the Reichstag. Uh, Germany, I mean Hitler is appointed the chancellor by Hindenburg, who's the president. Uh, but they're sort of held in check because most voters have voted against them. Uh, but then Hindenburg dies, and Hitler assumes the the positions of both president and chancellor. Um, it appears he orchestrated the Reichstag fire, but even if he didn't, uh, he seized upon that terrorist attack to adopt totalitarian powers, which is what governments always do. And he ends up with these dictatorial powers. There's some Germans that, that were seeing through what was going on. The, the Scholl parents were, were among them. Lots of Germans were. But as things progressed, it became very, very uh, dangerous to express any dissent because uh, the the powers that Hitler had gotten in the Enabling Act after the Reichstag fires uh, enabled them to round people up, torture them, kill them. And so dissent started to go down. And then once the war hits, uh, dissent became an impossibility. And the Gestapo would round up anybody that even hinted dissent, like they had arrested uh, Hans and Sophie's father for saying something to a neighbor to the effect that Hitler's leading us to doom, and they put him in jail. And this was uh, just immediately before the White Rose or around the time the, the White Rose pamphlet started to be published. Uh, so, you know, it, it's one of these things where as government moves toward war and crises, uh, it becomes more dangerous to dissent against the regime, uh, if the if the regime is going to be squashing that dissent, which it oftentimes does. Jacob, are you familiar with uh, Milton Meyer's book, They Thought They Were Free, The Germans, 1933 to 1945? Yes, it's been a long time, but I read that book. It's. I think uh, he, he, he goes through the process by which 
the, the German people came to realize just how much distance had actually appeared between them and their government. And one of the points that he makes, and, and I think you can see this in Sophie Scholl's story, is it, it came incrementally. It wasn't like Hitler, you know, assumed power and out of the gate, you know, he was a iron-fisted totalitarian dictator. Uh, it came little by little, and each little act, the people who saw things that were, were not quite right were certain that at some point everybody's going to get it. We're all going to see there's going to be this big shock and everybody's going to wake up. But that shock never came because of the incremental nature by which that tyranny was able to assert itself and embed itself in, in German society. So by the time Sophie and, and the rest of the members of the White Rose uh, started to speak out, um, they knew, didn't they, that uh, this, this was, if they were caught, they were done for. Absolutely. And it's actually worse than what you described, because what a lot of people don't realize is that in the 1930s, Hitler was glorified as this heroic figure by many people, not, not just in Germany, who felt like, oh, he's bringing Germany back, but also by people in the West. There's, there's a famous quote by Churchill, that uh, Winston Churchill, that says that if England ever finds herself in the same desperate situation that Germany found itself, Self in, I hope we find our own Adolf Hitler. And, and wow. then the, uh, a few years ago, there was a fascinating expose of a magazine online that, that apparently is still in existence that had color photographs of Hitler's uh, home up in the mountains, uh, Wolf Garden or something like that. And, and th they had this whole spread that were sort of like glorifying this, this home of the German leader. And there were a lot of people who felt that way. This was, this was the era of the, the great leaders, you know. And you've got, you've got Stalin. You've got Roosevelt over here exercising really which dictatorial powers economically. I mean, that's what the, uh, the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act was about. This was also the advent of Social Security, which, is what, which had come from Germany and which Hitler believed in. And it was certainly uh, implementing in Germany public schooling, um, the, uh, the AAA. Uh, so, so there's a great, there's a great book called three new deals by a guy named Shibble Bush that compare Mussolini's economic program, Hitler's economic program and Roosevelt's and, and shows how similar they were. But as he's, as Hit, as Hitler is moving along and he starts doing all the anti-Jewish laws, especially after Kristallnacht, they were starting to to be more and more people questioning it, but even up to the war, there were a lot of people that liked this ruler because of his strong stance in leading Germany out of the out of the morass of the Great Depression and and World War One. I'm, I'm yeah, resisting. Time, I'm resisting the urge to talk about how he would make Germany great again, lest somebody get the wrong idea. But I, I somehow think that uh, there are some parallels between Weimar Weimar Republic Germany and America over the last, you know, 15, 16 years particularly that, that could be drawn. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, and that syndrome goes all the way back to the Great Depression where, where Roosevelt really did adopt dictatorial powers to, to deal with the Depression, and, and he didn't make any bones about it. I mean, nationalizing gold? I mean, th this, was, this was the official money of the United States, and it had been since the inception of the Republic. Uh, through the Constitution, and Roosevelt nationalized it, which was no different from the what the communists were doing to nationalize property. And his control over economic activity was no different from what Mussolini was doing, government business partnerships. Uh, and then you've got this syndrome today with Trump, where people are looking for the man on the white horse to solve the crises, and they don't care about the dictatorial powers. Or we look at post-9-11, where the government uses that emergency as a, an excuse to adopt the powers to assassinate Americans, to round up Americans and torture them, all upheld by the courts, and the, the opportunity to use the NSA to spy on people, record their telephone conversations. This is all Gestapo-type stuff. And it's, what's fascinating is a lot of Germans didn't see it as tyranny when the German government, their government was doing it, they felt that it was patriotic to support the government in times of crisis. Well, you see that same mindset here in the United States when yep. the government's adopting these totalitarian-like powers and people 
support it and say, oh, this is designed to keep us safe. And so it's always easy to recognize tyranny overseas. It's much more difficult to recognize it when your own government's doing it. And that was really the problem in Germany. Ger German concept of patriotism, support your government in time of war, especially in time of war or crisis or emergency, is, is that, that same kind of uh, patriotism concept, Brian, is held by Americans. That when your government's at war or there's an emergency, it's time to rally to the government, set our differences aside, get through the emergency, especially in war. You know, you're supposed to rally to the flag in times of war. So here, all of a sudden, the Scholl siblings are going against that mindset that holds both Germans and Americans in its grip and saying, no, in time of war, it is the job of the citizen, the responsibility of the citizen to make a close examination of what his government is doing. And if his own government's in the wrong, to stand up against its government, even though uh, it's war and the, and the soldiers are out there fighting and dying on the battlefield. So what was it? The, that was the breaking point for Sophie Scholl and the others in the White Rose. Um, obviously, they saw that things were wrong, but but the risk was was very great. At some point, they encountered something that caused them to say, "I I have to stand up and speak out." Yeah, I think it had been, it had been building, and then they had this philosophy professor who I think his name was Huber, and um, he actually um, lost his life um, at the at the guillotine just like they did, but. Um, they had they'd been listening to, to his lectures where he would kind of poke fun at the Hitler regime and, and talk about the role of the state and so forth. But I think the catalyst came when they got wind of what was going on on the Eastern Front, that the, the Nazis had, had massacred a bunch of Jews um, in Eastern Europe, and they had massacred a bunch of Russian prisoners. And I think that was, a, that was one of the breaking points. I think it had been building, but when that came about, that's what I think stirred the, the first or second uh, essay. Now, interestingly enough, there have been some great movies on this. The, the best one is Sophie Scholl, The Final Days, which I highly recommend. It's a German movie, but it's absolutely fantastic, and it's gotten many awards. And there's others online that, that are free, two or three others about the story. Um, but um, interestingly enough, that the when Sophie arrives at the University of Munich, she doesn't She's kind of a innocent, naive girl, excited about being in college, of course. And she doesn't realize that her brother, uh, Hans, is engaged in this. And he's doing it secretly with some friends of his, Christoph Probst, who, who was the only married guy in the, in the bunch, a guy named Willie Groff, um, and, and a few others. And uh, she, she discovers uh, just by happenstance that they're the ones that she had, she had seen these essays and she was stunned by them because they'd be kind of left out on the campus uh, secretly. And she picked up one and was just stunned by what it was saying, by the truth of it all. And then she, dis she discovers by happenstance that her brother's the one who's authoring this thing. And he didn't want to tell her because he didn't want to risk her life. And, and yeah, they, they all, to answer your question, they all knew what was at stake here. Uh, that, that, while there's been a long tradition in German history about tolerance for student activity on campus, dissidents, and so forth, that came to an end in the Hitler regime. And so they all knew that if they got caught, it was going to mean death, uh, which, which I think makes their resistance even more impressive because the chances that they were going to overthrow the Hitler regime were pretty minimal, and I think they recognized that. But they were so committed to just truth that um, and to the to what they believe was right, that they were willing to risk their lives uh, for what they believed in, and and so it's it's a tremendous story of courage. I mean, this woman was 21 years old. Her brother was 23 years old. Uh, I think Christoph Probst was in that same age group. He he had a wife and child. He knew what the risks were. Uh, Willie Groff did. So did the professor. I mean, it's really a absolutely fascinating story. So. We're going to link to, uh, the, in this podcast, which is societyinthestate.com slash 28, I will have links to the uh, full movie on YouTube of Sophie Scholl, The Final Days. I'm also going to have a link to your article of um, the White Rose, A Lesson in Dissent. Now, at the time that uh, the White Rose was caught and, and that they were, were put on trial, talk to me about the kind of trial that took place and... and um, whether or not it, it served justice in any sense of the word. 
Yeah, in fact, the, the movie The Final Days gives a very accurate depiction of, of what happened at the trial, and I put trial in quotation marks, uh, because it's based on the, the archives that were discovered in, in East Germany when the wall came down. Uh, the Germans keep very meticulous <laughs> records. Uh, well, what happened, it was a really disaster. That they're, they're at the University of Munich. They were on about their sixth essay, and it was very early in the morning. No students were there. She and Hans were there. And she had a bunch of a, a stack of, of leaflets left over that they had been pass, passing out, leaving them on chairs and stuff. And so she decides she's on an upper floor and there's a courtyard that overlooks a courtyard. And so she decides at the last second to just throw them over and let them fly out into the courtyard. And unfortunately, there was a janitor that saw her do this. And he immediately, he, now, in his mind, he's a patriot, you see. Sure. He immediately goes and locks the doors, calls the Gestapo, and they're taken into custody. And they're interrogated, and it wasn't difficult you know, to, to ferret out that, that they had done this. And then they, they search the, their home, and, and the, the trail leads to other people, Christoph Probst and, and Willie Groff and so forth. But they have a trial. They, they bring to Hitler— Hitler wanted to really make an example out of the, these kids. And so he brings down Roland Freisler, who was the head of what's called the People's Court, which is another kind of um, example for, for America, because the People's Court was a, was a tribunal for terrorism cases. And it was, it was created because the, the regular federal courts of, of Germany— had um, had acquitted some of the Reichstag fire terrorists, the people who had been suspected of terrorism there, and that just threw Hitler into a rage uh, that you know these were terrorists that the courts had let off, and so he creates a special tribunal for to try terrorism and treason cases. Well, the parallel of that, of course, is what the Pentagon, the CIA, did with their military tribunals in in Guantanamo. I mean, that's why they were created, to avoid the federal court system, the chance of acquittals, defense lawyers, and so forth, and to guarantee a verdict of guilty. Um, and so, not surprisingly, the tribunal in, in the Sophie Scholl case is very similar to the military tribunals at Guantanamo Bay. The verdict is cooked. Uh, the Scholl siblings were not given a chance to defend themselves. They're, quote, defense lawyers. Um, essentially acted as just passive agents of the Reich regime, because if they stood up and defended their clients, they'd be put in jail. And so, but to watch the courtroom scene is fascinating because you see Freisler coming down with this tirade of what happened to you kids? You know, you, he's essentially saying you come from nice families and they did, they were middle-class families. And, you know, what went wrong with you? That you, what turned you into traitors? What turned you into bad people? And and that's his mindset. And 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 you know, you, it's something that you can kind of relate to if you put yourself in the shoes of the government. Uh, but from those of us that are looking at it from a freedom standpoint, we're looking at them as the patriots. They're standing up for what's right against their own government. And she actually says, gets to finally speak some line. She didn't have permission, but she said something like, look, a lot of Germans believe as we do, and uh, they're just too scared to say it. But you watch, history will prove us correct. Wow. And he, Freisler just went into a tirade, screaming and yelling at her. And uh, so he, they issue the death penalty. And, and they're killed within three days of getting caught. I mean, there were no appeals, or there was an appeal, uh, and Hitler denied the appeal. And so three days afterward, they're guillotined. And when he's led to the guillotine, Hans Schultz, who's 23 years old, screams out, uh, long live freedom, in German, of course. And um, the, Sophie Scholl didn't flinch. I mean, they said that she just, she just walked there with pure courage and um, went ahead and let them kill her. And then Christoph Probst, he, his wife didn't even know that he was on trial. She didn't even know he had been arrested. That's how secret the proceedings were, because they had secret a uh, secret trial here. Uh, but you know, over time, the 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 story got out, and and today the Scholl siblings are heroic figures in German history for what they did. And that's that was where I ultimately wanted to see us uh, end up. 
they died as traitors. They were denounced and uh, vilified by those in power. But time has uh, the, the capability of bringing truth to the surface. And, and what, what is, how does Germany remember the White Rose today? Well, there was an interesting movie. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. It's, it's a German movie about the waning days of World War II. It was put out in the last five years or so. And uh, it was about, it revolved around German, uh, Hitler's secretary. Uh, I, I forget her name exactly. But uh, if somebody Googles German secretary movie, they probably will be able to pick it up. And what's fascinating is that it, so this, this woman who's, who's um, Hitler's secretary, uh, I mean, she's a young woman, 21, 22 years old, the same age as, as, as Sophie Scholl. And she goes to work. She has this opportunity to work for the president. Well, in her mind, boy, what greater honor could you have in a country than to work for the president? And so she's serving as, as Hitler's secretary during the war. And she doesn't see anything wrong with it. I mean, and, and I think most people would feel that way, that your nation's at war. The president says, would you come and be my secretary? Well, what's fascinating is at the end of the movie, they, they have the real secretary, not, not an actress, who makes a statement. And she says, you know, throughout the time, I was just doing my patriotic duty serving the, serving the president. Uh, and tell she, then she says, until after the war, and I learned about Sophie Scholl. And when I saw that, I said, wow, that's an amazing thing. And so, yeah, over, over time, after with the defeat of Nazi Germany and, and the, the rise of modern Germany, uh, it, it comes out, I mean, you know, we, we're often taught, or at least people were taught in, Ger in World War II, Americans were taught that all Germans were bad, they were all aggressive, uh, that it's okay to bomb Dresden and bomb, firebomb German cities because they're all one and the same. Well, they weren't all one and the same. I mean, this is a land of poets and a land of Mozart and, and, and Bach. And there, the, the, there was a large faction of Germans who didn't like Hitler and, and who, who actually opposed him. And so that Germany starts rising again in the post-war era. And they start discovering Hans and Sophie Scholl and Christoph Probst and, and the White Rose. And so th there's a number of public schools named after the Scholl siblings in Germany. And they, they, they're well recognized. Every time I run into a German American, uh, I ask him, I say, are you familiar with the White Rose? And the answer is always, oh, yes. Uh, so people are taught that, hey, this is what the real Germany was all about. This is what real patriotism is all about. This is what real courage is all about. The willingness to stand up against your own government, even in time of war, when your government is in the wrong. Okay, Jacob, one final question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, what's the takeaway for, for modern Americans who are now, you know, decades removed from World War II and, and the White Rose? There are still lessons that we should be able to apply in our own lives. What would you want people to take away from our discussion of the White Rose? That we have to do the same thing in the United States. We, we have to follow in this tradition of Hans and Sophie Scholl, this, this tradition of pa genuine patriotism that it does a constant examination of the conduct of our own government. You know, wh what is it doing in overseas lands? What's it doing with invasions, uh, coups, alliances with dictators, foreign aid to dictators, a war on terrorism, totalitarian powers like the power to assassinate, power to torture, power to round people up, to spy on people, keep secret records on them. And if one comes to the conclusion, as I have, that all of this is wrong, this is a dark side that America has embraced with this whole national security establishment and foreign interventionism, it is incumbent on the citizenry, especially when they're not rounding us up and jailing us and, and guillotining us as the Hitler regime was doing to people there. It's incumbent on us as citizens to take a stand against the wrongdoing of our own government. And really, it's, it's the same tradition, Brian, of people like Jefferson and Madison and Washington that, that took a stand against their own government, because remember, those were British citizens that signed the Declaration of Independence. Sure. And it's in the same tradition as, I'm a native Texan, as those guys at the Alamo that were Mexican citizens. That was the northern part of Mexico that said, we must take a stand against the wrongdoing of our own government. That's the lesson we walk away from this, that, that 
patriotism does not mean blind support of whatever one's government does, including in war. It means examining your, the, the actions and the policies of your own government, and when they're wrong, taking a stand against them. Jacob Hornberger with the Future of Freedom Foundation, thank you so much for being our guest. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Brian. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. Thank you.